well, I think I'm going to do good this second service. First service, that, that cough was still there, and I, I actually got bronchitis. <coughs> so I was off for <coughs> almost two weeks. It'll be two weeks this coming Tuesday, and I'm definitely feeling better. The first service started a little rough, but uh, got through it, so hopefully we start off right. Of course, the minute you say that, you start coughing, right? <coughs> <coughs> so let me get one of these ready, this lozenges, just in case. Let's open up our Bibles to First uh, Peter, chapter two, <coughs> and we'll be looking at verses thirteen through seventeen. <coughs> and as you can see, the the topic today is submission to government. <coughs> now you might be saying, what does that have to do with church? Submission to government. Well, it's in the Bible. And as we go through the Bible, we're going to hit every topic that is known to man. And it's important that we as believers know how to live our lives in a world where we need to submit ourselves to government and through the regulations and so forth. And it is those believers that love the Lord Jesus Christ that say, Lord, help me to live the way you want me to live. Not just in my relationship with my husband or wife or my children, but in this world. And that includes government and how we should submit ourselves to government. So we're going to exhaust (coughs) that thought. (coughs) Um, (coughs) Actually, we're going to spend the next three weeks Looking at submission, <clears throat> submission to government, submission to employees, employers, submission to husbands, submission to one another. So we're going to exhaust that idea of submission. I know we don't like it too much. Talk about submission. Another word, another word that we use is uh, humble yourself and be a person of humility, <clears throat> you know, under someone else. So we're going to exhaust that. So let's pray and get into the word. <clears throat> Father, we, we just open up your word now, Lord, and, and I know it's not a subject that we all think about very often, Lord, though we experience in life, many of us have to deal with government in one form or another, whether it's the, um, the court system or whether it's in our relationships or, or whether it's a police officer. First Peter. <clears throat> Chapter 2. Again, we'll be looking at verses 13 through 17. And we'll be talking about submission to government. There's a little humorous story that I read about a highway patrol sitting on the side of the road there waiting for speeders. (coughs) Along came a car filled with some old ladies, three sitting in the back seat, <clears throat> but they were going 22 miles an hour. They were actually going too slow. So he thought to himself, well, that's dangerous too, so let me pull them over. So he hit his lights and he pulls them over. And as he walks out of the car and he notices that the ladies in the back seat were a little shaken up, they were shaking a little bit, a little nervous, thought that was odd, and he went to the driver's side and <clears throat> said, um, did you know that you were driving at 22 miles an hour. And she's like, yes, officer, was there a problem with that? Well, yeah, that's too slow. Well, but the sign said 22. And he said, no, that's not the speed limit. That's the route that you're on, route 22. She's like, oh, okay. And so he warned her to be careful, not to slow down too much, you know, and to stick with the speed limit. And as he's walking away, he turned to the three ladies in the back and says, are you okay? Look a little shaken up. And they looked at him and said, yes, officer, we're, we're okay. We just came off of Route 142. <laughs> so you can imagine old ladies driving 142 miles an hour. Yeah, that would shake me up too if I was in the back seat with an old lady driving. Nothing against old ladies. <clears throat> Last week we, we looked at a couple, of, uh, actually a couple of weeks ago, we looked at a couple of verses, verses 11 and and 12, where Peter gave some instructions to believers. He said in verse 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts 
which were against the soul, having your conduct honorable among Gentiles, that when they speak against you, that is the world or government or those that are in charge speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in a day of visitation. And so he gave us instructions when we left off last, encouraging the believers, that is Christians, that, that in light of this hostile environment that you may live in, this government that doesn't like Christians and in fact is persecuting Christians, we have to rise above the situation and, and, and we need to display Christ even in these hard times. We have to be examples. We have to be light and we have to be salt. Uh, we need to be able to endure the hardships, the sufferings and the trials that may come with living in a world that is hostile towards Christianity. And we know through the context here and through history, and I've been sharing it with you, that Nero hated Christians. He used them as torches in his garden. He would literally put them on stakes and light them on fire as they were alive, burning at the stake in a sense. And so Peter is encouraging them at that time, look, you have to live godly lives. You have to separate yourself. Even though you're being persecuted and you may not like it, and the tendency is human behavior and the nature is to rebel and say, you know what, I'm not going to live this way anymore. It's not getting me anywhere. It actually is hurting me. And I don't want to be hurt, nor do I want to see my family hurt. But there's a bigger picture, isn't there? There's a picture of eternal life, eternal security in heaven. And really that's where we live and we are looking forward to. So taking the attitude that if you kill me or slay me, so absent from the body is present with the Lord. Yeah, We go home to be with God. So, hey, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to separate myself from this world. And I'm going to do it to be an example to you, to let you know, even though you're persecuting me, I can still love you. In fact, if you want to take my life, then go ahead and take it. I will glorify the God that I believe in all the way till death. We saw that with the three Hebrew children, right? As they were being persecuted. And Nebuchadnezzar was in, in a sense, incense, incense in that they wouldn't bow down to him. And so he took these three young men and he threw them into the fiery pit. And they were an example, even in a fiery pit. And it says that they were dancing around with the Lord. He says, didn't we throw three in there? And yet there's one that looks like the Son of God. And there was the Lord with them in this pit that was seven times hotter than anything before. In fact, the guards that, that took them to the pit were burned up instantly. That's how hot it was. And yet they made the choice to stand up for righteousness, to be an example. And boy, did it convert Nebuchadnezzar because of that example. We have to make that example. We see the bigger picture. If you want to take my life, go ahead, take it. But I'm going to live for Christ. I love you. I care about you. And you need Jesus Christ. How many stories have you heard of people being robbed or people doing evil things to Christians and the Christians standing up and praying for them and loving them? Years ago, there were a couple of pastors, about three of them. They were on their way to Australia. <coughs> One of them was John Miller of Calvary Chapel, the barn out here. So they took their, their little van with all their supplies to LAX to fly over. Well, they weren't familiar with LAX. They got lost. <clears throat> and you can get lost in LA. There are a lot of one-way streets, right? Well, they were lost and they ended up in a dead-end road. And so as they were trying to turn around, several guys pulled out guns and stopped them. Pulled them out of the vehicle at gunpoint and said, we're going to take everything that you have and then we're going to kill you. And so here they are, ready to do God's work, and now they're threatened. <clears throat> and so they put them all in the back of the van and they're driving around L.A. for hours, blindfolded. So John Miller decided, you know what? He says, we're going to die anyway. So let's preach the gospel. So they just started preaching out loud to their captors talking about Jesus Christ and his love and what he has done for them. One guy began to shout, shut up. We don't want to hear that. And he kept screaming it, but they kept, they kept on and on and on. So finally they said, that's it. And they pulled over, blindfolded, pulled them out, and they could feel the chain link fence that they were up against. <laughs> and they could hear the guns in their hands. And, and all of a sudden they're thinking, this is it. So they started preaching even louder and then louder. And then all of a sudden they heard the van just take off. They left them there without killing them. 
you know, they were examples. And because of those examples, God decided to spare their lives. You know, I wonder whatever happened to those uh, men if they ended up becoming Christians or not. But there's something to be said about those that even till death, even while under persecution, that they will not deny their faith. So today we're going to look at (laughs) verses 13 through 17. Peter says, therefore, so in light of this, even under this hostile environment, therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. For the Lord's sake, underline that for the Lord's sake. The only reason that we submit ourselves to government is for the Lord's sake. Because you love the Lord. How many love the Lord? Then obey the Lord. If you love the Lord and you know what His will is, then be obedient to His will because you love Him. It's really that simple. For His name's sake I do this, Lord. It's because I love you, because you saved my soul from the pit of hell. It's the only reason that John Miller and them were able to do it, because they knew God. They knew that, hey, you kill us, we go home to be with the Lord. So we're going to witness to you. We're going to share the gospel, and you're going to hear it, whether you like it or not. You think we're the captive audience? You're the captive audience. And you're going to hear that gospel message. So for the Lord's sake, they did it, whether to kings as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God. Underline that. This is the will of God. Very clear. What's the will of God? That you submit to the ordinances or the laws of the land. This is the will of God. That by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free. Now this is the character of of the believer. As free, not using liberty as a cloak for vice or sin. But as bond servants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So let's talk about submission to government. Well, what does that have to do with us today? We all have to deal with government, don't we? <clears throat> we all live in homes. We all have to pay taxes. <laughs> we have to deal with law enforcement once in a while. When, when I was a kid, I was in rebellion towards government. Living in this community, if you lived here and if you come from a impoverished background, you understand what I'm about to say because we've all had our dealings with police officers. You know, and not all police officers are righteous officers. There are corrupt officers. We see this in Orange County. There was a lot of corrupt police officers, even in the high ranking uh, of the uh, OC police uh, department. You know, some of them even went to jail because of it. So just because he's a police officer doesn't mean that that he's a righteous police officer. Though, let me say this, there are a lot of righteous police officers too. But be that the case, we need to still submit to those police officers if we have uh, dealings with them. Uh, Months ago, Stephen would get pulled over by a police officer here in the community. You know, We live in a community, a drug-infested community. A Dodd Street gang is right there. I mean, we have drug houses all over the place. Uh, it's amazing what goes on in this place. In the newspaper, uh, some guy was actually going to municipal uh, water companies and stealing their, their stuff and then putting them in his house, you know, cause hoping to sell. He had like $60,000 worth of equipment and things like this. Just recently was in the paper. And so <clears throat> we live in a corrupt area, you know. And so you're going to have these situations like Stephen, every morning he'd come come to church at 5 o'clock in the morning. He's riding his bike, didn't have a car. So he's riding his bike to come serve the Lord. The police stops him. What are you doing out so early? Whose bike is this? Questioning him. And of course, you know, he had <coughs> nothing to hide. <clears throat> I'm going to church. What church? The one over here in the corner. So he had to explain himself several times to this police officer. But he was very, you know, Obedient, it kind of ticked him off in the beginning. I remember him being a little, why do they have to pull me? I'm not doing anything wrong. So just be respectful. That's all you need to do. Well, one day, his bike was ripped off. And there's this guy riding his bike down by the high school. And the police officer saw him and saw the guy riding his bike. said, that's not his bike. I know that bike. So pulled him over and said, where'd you get the bike? It's my bike. No, it's not. I know who's, who it belongs to. It was Stevens. And the guy stole it from his house. And so the police officer arrested the guy, took the bike back to Steve and said, hey, here's your bike so you can go to church. You know, there's something to be said 
about being respectful and honorable of police officers, whether they're corrupt or not. There's a purpose behind that. We're going to see that today. So there's a responsibility, and we're going to see this in chapters 2 and 3, the responsibility of a believer when it comes to submission to government. And one of the reasons is is to silence those that are ignorant, those foolish men. That, hey, here we are Christians, and we can obey the law. In fact, we're going to be respectful, and we're going to honor you in your position and your place. But not just to government, but submission to masters. We all have employers. We work for them. We get a paycheck at the end of the week. We need to work for them and work hard. Because we don't work for them. We work for who? God. He is the one we're working for. God sees us all the time. And so we can't be goofing around. We can't be lazy. We need to work hard. And when you work hard, you get rewarded for working hard. That's how it works. You don't get rewarded by your boss or your supervisor. You get rewarded by God. God will make sure that he lays it in their hearts to to take care of you. God will make sure that he puts it in their hearts to watch over you and to keep you and to value you. But if you don't do those things, you're not allowing God to work. And so we'll talk about that submission to masters or employees. And then wives to husbands. And in this case, Peter talks about how you can win the unbelieving husband. Uh, One way is by submitting to your husband. I know that's a harsh word for for some of the ladies, and I don't envy you being a lady, and I know it's difficult in this day and age, especially when women's rights uh, came into our society and said that um, you are equal to man, and you are, and you've always been in the eyes of God. It's just that our society has manipulated and misused those terms. And so submission is, is actually a good thing and not a bad thing. So we'll talk about that um, <clears throat> wives submitting to their husbands. Why? That they might win some unbelieving husbands. Uh, there are husbands that don't know the Lord. And oftentimes you're the only gospel that they're reading because they're not willing to read uh, the Bible and so they're reading you. And everything that you do as a Christian woman will reflect Christ or deflect Christ from their hearts. And so it's up to you to freely choose to submit to your husbands. And then husbands need to understand uh, their wives and give honor to their wives. We'll talk about that. Why? So that their husbands' prayers are not hindered. We'll see that in chapter 3. So let's get into verse 13. Peter says, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme, and in verse 14, or to governors. Now we'll stop there. <laughs> Remember, there are, there are no verses Verse numbers in the Bible. We've added those in there just for clarity. And so they really should have stopped at governors there in verse 14. So we'll add that because he tells us, therefore submit to these ordinances, whether they're supreme or whether there are governors. Now the word submit, let's understand that word submit because to us it's a four letter word, actually five letter word, six letter word that's bad. You know, it's a six letter word that we think is bad. A lot of people just don't like that word. I don't know how many times I've used the word submit in front of ladies and like, oh, how dare you even think about that? You know, don't you know that we went through a revolution, you know, so that that didn't happen anymore? I don't have to do a thing my husband tells me to do, that type of attitude. You know, I'm like, ooh, okay, I'll stay away from that one. I don't want to do, go down that road and so forth. But submit is a good word. It, it, it's not a bad word. It's, it's actually a good word. When you look at the relationship of the Trinity, you see total submission on all three parts. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are in total submission to one another. The Father who's the head, Christ who submits himself to the Father. He said while he was on this earth, I do all things that the Father directs me to do. Without hesitation and without doubt, I do it all. You mean even to the cross? You mean when the Father put him in a position, in a place where he'd get hurt, he still did it? Yeah. Yeah. So what are you saying? That I, I need to submit to my husband? He's going to hurt me? I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm telling you the importance of submission. The Holy Spirit submitted to Jesus and to the Father. Now when you take that Trinity and you bring it down to our level, which is really impossible to do. Maybe we ought to rise up there, which is impossible to do also. But you see that in the family you have the head, the, the husband and the wife and then the children. And the husband is the head to lead with reverence and, and gentleness and, 
and scripturally speaking, leading with truth and honor. And when he does that, the wife submitting to him and then the children submitting to both the husband and the father. And it's an example of the Trinity. It's perfectly clear right there. That's how it should be in our society today. And we need to take the vanguard, the forefront. We need to really be the example to the world out there. Ladies, you have a great responsibility there. And we as believers have a great responsibility towards government. Let's get back on track because it's talking about government here. <coughs> we are to submit ourselves. The word submit there is under, tasso, to arrange in an orderly manner. Ephesians uses it in a military term. It's like putting yourself under a commander. Uh, you are You are a soldier. And you are under your commander. And when your commander says to go there or to do this or to do that, you are to do it without hesitation because he is your commander. doesn't mean that you're not equal. doesn't mean that he's smarter than you. It just means that he's in charge and he's responsible. <clears throat> he will always be responsible for you. But you are to be obedient. And boy, I would not have liked to have been in some of these wars when he says, okay, you first. I'm like, well, why me? Why not him? Because I've just asked you to go first. And that's just the way it is. And you may die. And chances are you will die. And many have died. (laughs) But as believers, we know absent from the body is present with the Lord. So we should not fear death at all. It was Spurgeon who said, We are to obey kings and governors and magistrates, even when they may not be all that we wish them to be. We live in a day and age where our government is not all that we want them to be, right? <clears throat> there are a lot of problems. <clears throat> our Secretary of Defense, I believe, he just retired. <clears throat> he wrote a book and he's telling all about Obama. He's talking about how Obama does not care for our soldiers. Talking about how Obama doesn't really understand the foreign affairs and how he's <clears throat> really not concerned for those things. Others are talking about, I was reading an article by a reporter, <laughs> author, <clears throat> and he was basically saying, I'm not a comp- conspiracy theorist, but I'm clear of this. Obama does not like America. He does not like America. And he is ripping America apart constitutionally. You know, what does that mean for us in the future? I don't know. Uh, someone can take over once his, his term is done. And bring things back to some order, I hope. That would be nice. (coughs) Or it could get worse. You don't know. Next guy could be just as bad on the same agenda. You just don't know. And so even in light of all of these things that are going on in our nation, we need to still submit ourselves to governments. Well, when when is it that we don't? At what point do we say, no, I'm not going to listen to government? Well, (laughs) <laughs> in China, you can only have so many children. And so if you have a certain amount of children, then the other children, you really are supposed to take um, some sort of contraceptives or you have an abortion. Okay? What if our government decides that you can only have two children? And if you have another child, we will take you to a clinic and we will abort that child. Now, we have a choice. Do we submit ourselves to that government or do we submit ourselves to the word? Because we know the word talks about life and how he values life and that every child is a life human being with a purpose. No matter what the world says, it is a human being with a purpose. And so we need to choose. And there's that line. We say, "Okay, we're going to submit ourselves and have an abortion and kill this child. Or we say, no. I'm going to submit to God and I will not kill this child. I will run away. I will do whatever I need to do. I will protect myself, even if it means the death of myself and my child, but we will stand for righteousness. We will have that choice. That's where the line needs to be drawn. (laughs) And that's where we step over it. It's tricky because I I hear Christians drawing a line on certain things and it's not necessarily doctrinal things. It's more of their opinion. Remember, Peter's living during a time where they're killing Christians. They're stripping families apart. They're putting them on post and burning them. And yet he's telling them to submit to government. Because that does not violate the scriptures. 
Persecution isn't a violation. Well, we're persecuted, so we don't have to listen to the government. That's not a that's not a scriptural thing. It, it, in fact, the Bible says you will be persecuted. It doesn't say fight when you're persecuted. It says submit yourself. In fact, one of the Beatitudes talks about those who are persecuted, right? That we're to rejoice when we're under persecution. For ours is the kingdom of God, and we'll be in heaven. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> <clears throat> I can't, I'm, did I, did I tell you the story about my rebelliousness towards government with my moped? I didn't tell you guys, huh? Yeah, that was the first, first service. I forgot already. I'm getting, I'm getting old. 2014. I'm already losing my mind. <laughs> because we have this tendency of being rebellious. You know, I remember when mopeds came out. I don't know if you guys know what a moped was. Some of us older guys, when you get your learner's permit, you know, you always want to drive. Well, not all of us can afford a car, but we can afford a moped. For $600, you could buy what they called a moped. And it was called, Foxy was the brand, Foxy Moped. So I got myself a little Foxy Moped. It was a bicycle with a motor on it. So as long as you had enough money to put gas in it, you were fine. You could drive all over the place. In fact, Virginia, my wife, I used to go to her house a lot with my moped to go see her when I was in uh, high school, ninth grade. <coughs> so I'd drive up there. <coughs> but if you ran out of gas, it had pedals. And you can just pedal home like a like a bicycle. So it's pretty neat. And so I had a lot of fun with it. In fact, I wrecked it completely at one point. <clears throat> but whenever I would see police officers, because of where I grew up, you know, I knew they were going to stop me. I just knew it. Well, what's that Hispanic doing with a moped? You know, he doesn't belong on that. So I would start driving around crazy, you know, hiding and running from them. And they chase me, you know, until I find, oh, you're after me. So I'd pull over, you know, and then we'd go through this. This whole deal. Yeah, what do you want? What did I do wrong? Well, we're just checking you out. What are you doing? Well, I'm just driving on my moped. Is that your moped? Yeah, it's my moped. Are you sure you got any proof? I go, well, no. I mean, there's no legal proof. You don't need a license or anything because they're really a bicycle with a motor on it. You know? So, okay, well, open up that lock. We want to see you know if you know the combination or not. So I'm like, ah. So I kind of play around. Ah, I don't know. I don't, why do I have to do that? You know, just rebelliousness. So then finally, okay, here I go. And I open it. All right. So they knew it was my, my moped. But just that rebelliousness. And that's how we are sometimes towards government. We just get rebellious, you know, instead of honoring them and respecting them as Peter is telling us to do here. We can't have that attitude, even though there may be some bad police officers. You know, even though we might not like the fact that they pull us over for the wrong reasons. You know, sometimes they'll see your righteous acts. I was pulled over here on Wineville. I shared with you months ago. Um, I went, I did a California roll on, on Wineville. They put a stop sign there. You know the one right there now? And so I did a California roll. How many got stopped right there? Ah, I knew it. Because they're, it's a trap. Yep, it's a trap right there. They're purposely doing that, knowing that, that it's new and people are just going to roll through it. So, <laughs> California roll. I pulled over and right away had my light. I had everything out because I know what they're going to ask. And roll around. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes. Here's my license. Oh, here's my insurance. Yes, sir. It was just very respectful. Went back, came back, and he said, boy, your record is clean. You got no problems. I go, no, no, sir, I don't. He goes, well, I don't want to mess up your record, so just be careful. And he gave me just a warning. I was like, See, it really goes to show you if you live in submission to the government and to the laws of the land, you know, God will take care of you and watch over you. Now, that doesn't mean that I've never done a California stop before, because <laughs> I have, or that I don't speed, because I do. <coughs> but <clears throat> they're there for our protection, and we'll see that. Look at what he says in the next statement. As to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. And so the purpose for government is to punish those that are evildoers who break the law. There are various reasons why we have government. One is protection, as he says here. In fact, in the very beginning, remember Cain and Abel? And Cain murdered Abel, and so God had to establish some form of government for the protection of mankind. You can't let that happen again. You don't just kill your brother because you're angry that you didn't bring the right offerings to God. You know, and so God established a government. He was that government in the beginning. Uh, Romans chapter 13 establishes a government and the purposes of government. Another purpose is, as Peter says, for the punishment of evildoers. We send them to prison. 
They spend time in there and hopefully they're rehabilitated. They can go back to society and become productive in society, which is very difficult for them to do. I understand that, you know, because of the strikes against them. But that's how government works. Uh, another function is the function of promotion. Human government is there to promote the general welfare of the community. You know, that we have the opportunity as men and women to to prosper here in America. And it's due to the government. They're not here with so many laws, though it's, it's getting less and less. But they're not here pushing and oppressing the people, but allowing them to grow. You're an entrepreneur. You have your own business. You have those opportunities where in other places you don't have all those opportunities to grow like that. So it is a good thing at the same time. Another reason is he says here is for the praise of those who do good. So <clears throat> you may be an outstanding citizen. <laughs> and there will come a time when, when you're in school or, or you go to some assembly or board meeting of the community or the city and and they look at you and they say here's an outstanding citizen you know he's outstanding in that he follows the law he pays his taxes you know he helps others he's here to serve and so then you get recognized for being that type of person we see a lot of political leaders that way we had a guy here mike goodlin who was an assistant pastor for a while and uh, got to know a lot of people. We, we, as a community, wanted to become a city, Harupa Valley, uh, and get rid of all the unincorporated areas. Well, he ran for city office. And so because of his relationship with a lot of people in our church here, and he was in this area to be elected in this area, a lot of people knew him. He was good standing, good citizen. He was a police officer at one time. Uh, as I said, an assistant pastor involved in churches and so forth, helping people and, and things. So he was recognized, and now he sits on the city council there of Rupa Valley, which is going under. Um, so they need to do something there <clears throat> in 18 months, otherwise we were back to our unincorporated areas. So <laughs> follow the laws of the land and be praised, be protected. God will watch out over you. Then in verse 15, for this is what? The will of God. So we know this is the will of God. You want to know God's will? To submit yourself to government. It's very clear that this is his will. What's the will of God? That by doing good, you may put to shame or to silence the ignorance of foolish men. So by your example, when they accuse you of things, you know, because you're not doing anything wrong, they can't say anything against you. So you're an example. You're light and you're salt to them. And that's good. Because now you have an opportunity to preach the gospel to those men or those people. Uh, because they see that you're an honest person. That you're righteous. And that you live rightly. And so you silence them. When someone accuses you, uh, that's not true at all. Because people know you. And they know you're not that way. And so they silence those foolish men. He says in verse 16, as free. So when believers are doing right. They silence the ignorant men. They muzzle them in a sense. And Peter says, because you're free. You're free to silence them by your way of life, by your way of living. Let me spend some time there because I think this is important in this whole message of submission to government. Is that we have a freedom as believers. Freedom from what? The word freedom here means emancipated. It's as though you were a slave but you were set free from that bondage. What were we enslaved to? We were enslaved to sin at one point. Before we knew Christ, we were slaves to sin. You might have been a partier. Hey, I like to party. And people are like that without Christ. I love to party. Friday nights, it's party night. Well, you were a slave to party night. What do you mean? You cannot just not party. You can't stay home, relax and do nothing and just enjoy your family, a, a time of rest and so forth. You have to party. Why? Because you're a slave to it. You're not in control. It's in control of you. And that's why so many young kids and young adults are like, no, we got to go out and party. If I don't go out and party, you know, I'm going to break up. Something's going to happen to me. I just need to get out there and party. Because they're a slave to it. They're a slave to alcohol. They're a slave to drugs. <clears throat> they're a slave to sex. They're slaves to sin. We're all slaves to sin. We're slaves to Satan and we're in bondage to it. 
And so at one point we were in bondage to sin. In other words, we could not sin. That was our nature. I don't have an addictive nature. Uh, many people do. Uh, their body makeup is very addicting. And so if they have uh, a tendency to have drugs, they can get hooked on drugs or you know, shackled to drugs because of their addicting nature. And they become addictive to that thing. I don't have that addicting nature. I can I can take drugs, I can drink, and then I can just quit. Just just my body makeup, and some people are that way, uh, <clears throat> but some aren't, and they get addicted and they're stuck. They're now in bondage to that sin. That sin is their master, and for the life of them, they cannot give it up. There's no way they're shackled to it for the rest of their life. How do they get out of it? It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Only by submitting ourselves to Christ, taking upon his work and being set free from those things. Just what Jesus said. Therefore was the saying to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's that word emancipation. The Greek word is eleutheo. And it means to be set free from something. He says, you'll be made free. And if therefore the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. It's only Jesus Christ who can free you from sin. Turn to Romans chapter 6. I want to develop this a little bit more. (coughs) If you are a believer in Christ Jesus and have given your life to him, (coughs) then you have been set free. In fact, you are free from sin and the bondage of sin. Well, wait a minute. Then why do I continue to sin? Because that's your nature. But you don't have to give in to it because you're free from it. What happens is is that we like it because sin is pleasurable. And because it's pleasurable, we continue to live in it. Because we think that it's fulfilling us somehow. But in a sense, it's, it's like trying to fill an empty bucket. You'll never fill it. It's got a hole in the bottom. And the more you try to put in, the more you're going to want. And that's what sin does. It deceives you. It makes you think that you're, you are fulfilling yourself in drugs and alcohol or sex or pornography or whatever it is. But in reality, you're just filling that emptiness and making it worse and worse and worse. Because the more you put in, the more you want. Because you're in bondage to it. And as believers, we sometimes will use the excuse, well, Jesus is gracious. He's forgiving God. And Paul even said, where sin is, grace even abounds more. So, so let me sin even more so that it reveals how great God's grace is towards me. I understand that. And he is gracious. But it's a bondage. And as long as you stay in that situation, you will be useless. God can't use you that way because you're in bondage. You're halfway in the world and halfway into Christianity. You might be a Christian, but you may not be either. There's an if. There's a question mark there. If you're born again, you've been set free from it. Look at what what, uh, Paul says in Romans. I should have turned there while I was talking. Chapter 6, verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to in sin that grace abounds? So he's asking the question, do we continue to sin? Now that we're believers, we're set free from sin. So do we continue to live that way? It's a question mark. And really it's a question that says no. And he says no, verse 2. Certainly not or no. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death? When we accepted Christ in our lives, just as he was killed on the cross, so our sin was crucified on the cross. That sin is dead. That old man is dead. We have been set free from that old man. Therefore, we were buried with him, verse 4, through baptism unto death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we should also walk in newness of life. So we as believers should walk as though we are free men. And we make the choice to say, I'm not in bondage to drinking and that's why I don't drink. Now some of us think that we can drink. 
And I understand there's that liberty. But when you drink and you drink and it offends somebody else or stumbles somebody, then you're sinning. You're sinning. Even if you're posting on Facebook, you're going out to dinner. Oh, we're at, you know, we're at uh, Johnny Carino's. And you got a margarita sitting right there on the table. You are causing someone else who has a tendency of being shackled to sin to stumble. And that sin's on you. And that shouldn't be. You want to drink? Drink at home. Drink in your closet. Have your drink. Let it relax you. Go to bed. Whatever you want to do at home. You get drunk, it's sin. You stumble under, it's sin. You need to be careful with that. You're not in bondage to sin any longer, nor should you put... un others into bondage of sin also. We've been set free from that. And we have to make that choice to walk in newness of life. You have a choice. Well, why do I have to drink? Why do I have to drink when I go out? Well, it just relaxes me. Really? Then don't tell anybody about it. Why do you have to tell someone about it? I think that's interesting. It reveals a person's heart when they take a picture of it and they post it on Facebook. Why would you do that when you know it could offend someone? It shows that their heart doesn't care for someone. They don't care what others think. I have a right to do this. I'm in charge of my life, see? And that's where they're lacking the submission to God's word. In offending others, and in offending him, and reverence for him. He goes on in verse 18 saying, Having been freed from sin, you became slaves of what? Righteousness in Romans 6.18. See, we are slaves now to righteousness. God has freed us from the bondage of sin. We're no longer in bondage to sin. We are now in bondage to righteousness. See, we're all slaves of something. (coughs) I'm a slave to church. I'm a slave to you guys. I'm a slave to His Word. I love being a slave to those things. Because they're fun. You know, I was sick at the beginning of the year and I miss... Uh, the Wednesday night <coughs> and the Sunday. <coughs> and I came the following Wednesday. I I was still sick, but I came. I wanted to just be here with God's people. And I tell you, when I got here, I was like, oh, Lord, I miss being here. Even though it was only a week, because I'm enslaved to it. I was addicted to it, and I needed to be here. And if I didn't come here, I was going through withdrawals. And as soon as I got here and started talking with a few people, I started crying. Because it's just like, I love being here. Because I'm a slave to it. I'm a slave to it.